Our next panel focuses on strategies for sustaining public engagement in a research career. The moderator for this session is Dr. Dominique Brossard. Dominique is a is professor and chair in the Department of Life Sciences Communication at University of Wisconsin-Madison and co-director of the Science, Media, and Public Research Group. She teaches strategic science communication theory and research with a focus on science and risk communication. She is a fellow of AAAS and an advisor to the AAAS Leshner Leadership Institute for Public Engagement with Science. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to her. Thank you, Emily. My pleasure to be here for this exciting panel. I think all of you, uh, you know, are aware that uh, we all want to sustain public engagement in a research career, but however, we may face some challenges in doing so. So I'm so excited to have an, a very uh, uh, expert panel that can talk about these issues today. And we're going to start with Ray Wing Grant, who will tell us about her experience in that regard. Dr. Ray Wing Ground is a large carnivore ecologist with National Geographic Society and American Prairie Reserve. Her work broadly explores the influence of human activity on large carnivore ecology using special modeling techniques to explore these relationships. Ray is currently studying the impacts of human activity on landscape views, habitat suitability, and habitat connectivity of grizzly bears in the Great Plains of Eastern Montana. She maintains a strong commitment to science communication and social justice advocacy. She frequently appears on stage, radio, and the press. Ray recently completed a postdoctoral fellowship as a conservation science research and teaching fellow at the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation at the American Museum of Natural History. So please join me in welcoming Ray. Thank you, Dominique, and thank you to AAAS for having me here to talk about one of my favorite things outside of carnivore ecology. It is absolutely, without a doubt, science communication. Um, something that I don't have a formal training in, but something that I have dedicated a large part of my time and it kind of feels like my life, too. Um, so I have a very short presentation. It's mostly what I think are very beautiful pictures. <laughs> um, so nothing that you need to really take notes about. And then my uh, fellow panelists are going to speak for longer and longer amounts of time. And then we're going to have a um, group discussion about some of these issues. So. Um, again, I'm a large carnivore ecologist. I'm fairly fortunate because I study bears and I study lions, and it's really easy to get people's attention when you study bears and lions. Um, what I don't promote as much is a lot of the work that Dominique um, introduced me as being an expert in. So a lot of the um, spatially explicit statistical modeling techniques that I use to study bears and lions that doesn't translate quite as well to the public all of the time. Um, but I work in landscapes a lot like this in this picture. So the Western United States, this image is from uh, Western Nevada at the California-Nevada um, political divide. Um, and in my hand is a uh, device, a uh, telemetry device that I use to track a lot of the bears that I'm studying. So again, we're here to talk about uh, public engagement. And again, I have been very fortunate because a lot of public engagement work has essentially been handed to me. Um, I just completed a three-year postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History. As you can imagine, a museum such as that one in New York City is committed to public engagement, right? It's a science communication institution in itself, along with being a research institution. So part of my postdoctoral fellowship was to talk to kids, as you see in this picture, to talk to diverse groups of um, youth that are from New York City, um, very urban populations who don't necessarily get out into the environment that much. They don't necessarily get out into nature that much, but we're able to bring them into the museum in order to give them a firsthand education. When I first started doing this work, I stumbled and I fell and I got it wrong all the time. And by the time I was finished with this fellowship, I felt very much like I was a pro at talking to some of these groups. And it helped me feel like I had a very very strong place in doing public engagement across wide varieties of the public. 
Um, just an example of the fun, non-statistical modeling work that I am able to do, it's a lot of capturing animals. So again, um, my presentation is full of visuals because I find that visuals are the automatic best way to capture engagement of the public. Um, but what I won't spend as much time talking about is how my work is um, directly important to a very small group of the public, rural Western landowners um, that are impacted by wildlife on their property, right? So a lot of the work that I do behind the scenes, I might not promote it so much on websites, on social media, and in public talks in big cities like this, is delivering the results of my work back to the people who are directly impacted by the conservation that is being done by me and my team. So trying to save wildlife um, sounds great to me, sounds great for healthy ecosystem function, but there's a, you know, a a small minority of people out there that are strongly against wildlife conservation because it directly impacts or could potentially impact their livelihood. So here I am working with an individual who is from the community, a rancher, a landowner, who is getting to know what it's like to get up close and personal with a bear, to touch a bear, to feel a bear, and to understand a bear, and hopefully change his mind about his stance towards wildlife conservation. That is hands-on public engagement one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's not easy, it's not time efficient, but it can actually make a huge difference in terms of the work um, and the implications for the work. And again, I've had um, the good fortune to work at organizations and institutions that do a lot of promoting of public engagement. So public talks, um, I was at the American Museum for many wonderful years and now am a biologist with National Geographic Society. Two organizations that are extremely public facing that value um, science communication on a very broad, even international media level and have given me the tools to be good at this. So that's a little introduction into me and a lot of what I do. Um, what I'm going to do next is offer a lot of suggestions um, for how to best do this work, maybe to give you all some tools um, to use yourselves or for some of your colleagues to use in order to really make sure that you're centering authenticity. So that has been my number one ticket to creating and sustaining public engagement is to make sure to be my authentic self and to celebrate my individuality and the individuality of the people that I work with. So that brings me to Twitter. And I'm sure everyone in here is very familiar with a few years ago when this magnificent hashtag was created on Twitter that celebrated people like us, actual living scientists. And <laughs> excuse me, until this time, my social media world was very much filled with um, my fellow peers, my fellow academics, my fellow ecologists and wildlife biologists. And with the actual living scientist hashtag, um, we were able to really expose ourselves, even if for a day or two, uh, to a wider community of people, particularly young people, who were writing science reports and needed to figure out, do scientists even still exist in the world today? And it was a wonderful form of exposure that I believe has maintained. So I used to be very skeptical about science communication on Twitter because I felt like I was just talking to my peers. And again, it's been movements and campaigns like this that have truly opened things up. Usually when I post this slide about intersectionality, I can run through it very quickly because I'm speaking to audiences um, that often look exactly like me, young women of color, um, but I might spend a, a bit of extra time on it uh, just in case. So intersectionality is essentially um, a way to center oneself um, as more than a single thing. Right, so if you look at one of these charts, you don't necessarily see profession um, listed on the chart, right? So one can be a scientist, and as a scientist, you can also be you know, of a certain gender identity, you can be of a certain um, age group, um, you can be of a certain social class, you can be of a certain racial or ethnic group and heritage, and all those things make up your identity. Um, when people are intersectional, um, oh, everyone is intersectional, but, but centering intersectionality is something that people need to make sure to do across all fields, right? I'll use an example of some discussion that recently happened 
um, in the institution where I work, where we were talking about the really magnificent centennial celebration next year of women's right to vote. Right? In 1920, women were given the right to vote in the United States, and it's about to be 2020. That's a really big deal. Um, <clears throat> however, that's definitely not an intersectional historical fact. Right, So women weren't given the right to vote in 1920. White women were given the right to vote in 1920. Right, So someone who really centers their intersectional identity will say, well, this is not my centennial, and that's not meaningful for me. So whether we're talking about science, whether we're talking about American history, whether we're talking about politics or anything in between, making sure that we are able to uh, center ourselves as intersectional individuals and also each other and the people we work with is a really powerful tool and can also be used strategically in science communication and public engagement. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I approach audiences and very much center my African-American heritage, right? That's what I talk about, that's how I relate to people in the room. There are other times that I walk into the room and center my um, ecology training, and that's how I relate to people. More and more, I've been centering my role as a parent. I work in the American West with people who are quite different from me, but I have a three-year-old daughter and other people have three-year-olds running around too. And so you being able to pick and choose these different parts of my intersectional identity helps me be a good and effective scientist, right? So these aren't things that are mutually exclusive. And I encourage a lot of you to consider <clears throat> much more unapologetic and authentic um, self-awareness in this way and in the way that you do your SciComm. Excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold. I'll take us back just a little bit to Twitter again. Um, one of my favorite uh, ways to do a lot of my public engagement with science. And I will um, alert a lot of you to the fact that there are these different um, subgroups on Twitter um, that have to do with science. So different racial and ethnic groups or gender identifying groups that are often marginalized in society are often marginalized in science as well. And so when these groups come together and really advocate for each other, even if it's something as um, trivial as social media, it creates a community. Why I'm putting this up here is that it's important for other people who are not from these groups to also celebrate these people. If you're a white guy, it would be fantastic for you to promote a Latina woman and use a hashtag like Latinas in STEM, right? You don't have to silo yourself into your own particular group in order to celebrate and advocate for other people. So one of the things I invite everyone to do, if you are on Twitter, if you enjoy that platform, is to explore the different groups in your own STEM field that might not have as much of a voice but for whom you could amplify. All of a sudden, you might find yourself with a lot more followers, a lot more of the public who are engaged with your work because you're willing to recognize some groups that are very much unlike you, but whom you're celebrating. <clears throat> I'm gonna go back to authenticity and I'm gonna speak specifically for me. Um, I have often had a lot of success accidentally by just being my authentic self and I encourage a lot of people to, again, if you're a parent, um, if you have some special fun skill, <laughs> um, if you're a really good cook, if you're a baker, whatever it might be. So I have a uh, colleague who uh, calls herself Fancy Scientist, and you can find her across all social media platforms. And every Friday she highlights uh, dif different fancy scientists on her social media platforms. So she's essentially trying to remove the stereotype that if you are a very serious, very rigorous scientist, you are not someone who likes to dress up or wear makeup or put on heels and get fancy in that way. She's knocking down that stereotype by highlighting people in that way. And so just to run through some of her images, it can also be men, right? So it's everyone you know, deserves their light to shine. Um, and I'm on there too. But <clears throat> I do think it's a wonderful way that people can show, again, that intersectionality, their true authentic authenticity um, and identity that can help them uh, then be heard by more of the public um, in terms of their science. Another point that I could spend an entire panel discussing is talking about um, 
who might be invisible in our science communities. When we're talking about the public, often we're thinking of the far-reaching people who need to hear our messages. But often we're not necessarily making sure that we, are, we as scientists are deliberately touching on, valuing, and including the people who support our science work in our science communication. So who is the guy that I'm hugging in this picture? He was the driver um, that I used for a long time when studying lions in Tanzania, right? So he is not a trained scientist. He is not someone with any type of, type of academic degrees, but he is a part of my science and conservation community without whom my work could not have been done. So when I am deeply committed to engaging the public and getting words across, it's also important to me that I acknowledge all of the people who've been involved in me even doing the work to get to that place, right? It's fair, it's equitable, but it also will allow different types of people to feel like they can be included in science. Someone who's a driver, whether in Tanzania, whether here in the United States, wherever they may be, might feel more comfortable engaging in my science knowing that I value the drivers that I work with globally. Right? It's something that I um, strongly promote. And as a side note, I started my environmental science career as an administrative assistant at the World Wildlife Fund. I now have two master's degrees and a PhD and a postdoc and a job, but I was the person getting coffee and taking notes for a long time. Many people didn't include me as part of their science community, and yet I was. I was the support person who allowed them to do that work. Um, so I really try to give back in that way and make sure that different types of people aren't invisible in the community. Here's a tricky one that I'm going to show you, and I don't necessarily have the answer, <clears throat> but many scientists, especially in my field of wildlife conservation, travel away from the United States to parts of the world where they don't necessarily fit in and they are not necessarily from to do a lot of this work. It's really important when we are giving our presentations and when we are showing visuals of the work that we're doing to make sure to be equitable, to be fair, and to not perpetuate stereotypes of the people that we're from, especially when there could potentially be a neo-colonial leaning to the way that our science is done in especially the developing world. It's really, really tricky. Again, the reason I'm saying I don't have the answers to an issue like this is because I think it's much more appropriate for someone like me of a distant African heritage to take pictures with young people from that area. Um, but it might be different, and I encourage people to really think twice about doing that um, if you are not necessarily share that same ancestry. I don't have the answers. I would be willing and very happy to discuss this more um, at another time when I'm not running out of time. Um, but a lot of us are using images from the field in our science communication and trying to engage the public. Let's make sure that it's always uplifting and never driving the wrong message. One of the last things I'm going to talk about is taking risks. Um, I currently work at National Geographic Society. Um, I'm very proud of them because in the last one year, they have uh, released some very strong statements. Uh, making amends for some of their science communication mistakes and the ways they have made mistakes with engaging with the public, right? So in last April's magazine, it was about how they have perpetuated racism with their imagery for over 100 years and how they're not going to do it anymore and they are going to try to counteract that work, right? So. I am 100% positive that many of you guys come from organizations that have perpetuated really harmful stereotypes or problems in the world and the community via the vehicle of science. I would strongly encourage many of your organizations to really think about how far an apology might go, acknowledging those wrongdoings, and then working to fix them. If you really want to engage with the public, a really big way to do it is to to show that you are vulnerable and can make mistakes and can correct them. Um, it's worked really well for National Geographic. It's also the right thing to do. Um, but it's something definitely to consider. Again, one of the last things I'm going to say, and I'm almost done, <coughs> excuse me, 
is that before I got really good at science communication, almost all of my followers, almost all of the people who wrote to me, who found me and who I spoke to were fellow ecologists. So it goes without saying that as intersectional as I can get and as distant in my public engagement as I can get, my biggest supporters are my fellow ecologists. And so there is absolutely nothing wrong with making sure that your science communication and engagement is indeed somewhat, if not always, targeted to your core community. There are different types of ways to balance, and sometimes it might be a pendulum in terms of who your audience is, but I do try to make sure that I'm often coming back to that root group that I work with. I, at the same time, trying to make it more diverse, more inclusive, more equitable, but again, I have a lot of love for the people that I work with. Having fun is important. So for a long time, I thought that having a strong academic career meant not doing silly podcasts or you know, children's oriented science communication. But if you ever have the opportunity to do something that certainly doesn't take a PhD to do, I highly recommend that you do. I've had some fun um, talking about Winnie the Pooh, for those of you who might be American or British, you know who I'm talking about, and um, just different podcasts about, you know, just the, the non-academic aspects of my work. And again, in centering authenticity, um, it often looks like uh, to a lot of people that I went to school, I did really well at school, and I got the job, and everything's great, I'm gonna have a research career forever. So often when I'm speaking to young people, I talk a lot about how nonlinear my path was. You know, I shared with you all that I was an administrative assistant um, for many years, but it was a messy road to this career, and certainly I don't necessarily feel secure that, you know, environmental science career is something that I'll easily be able to maintain forever. So I, had, I encourage a lot of you when discussing with the public to be vulnerable enough to suggest that you don't necessarily have all the answers and every step of the way wasn't super easy. Um, and it allows you to kind of level the playing field and um, find commonalities with others. The last thing I'll say is that sometimes the best communication is no communication at all. Right? You don't necessarily have to go crazy staying up all night and up every morning doing science communication and engaging with the public. If you're off the grid, hopefully it's for a good reason. And it's always important to center your mental health, um, your work that pays you your real money, <laughs> um, and being the best scientist you can be will allow you to be the best science communicator you can be. So when you're not doing it, you're not doing it, and there's no need to apologize for that. So with that, thank you very much, and I will bring it to the next panelists. Thanks. Thank you, Ray. And uh, as uh, Ray was explaining, please hold your questions until the end of uh, our panelist presentations. You can also ask questions on Twitter. Actually, I'm, going, I'm getting them directly on this tablet here. So please do not hesitate to send uh, something that we can discuss later on uh, with the panelists. Our next uh, presenter is Laura Schmidt Olavisi. Dr. Laura Schmidt Olavisi is an associate professor in the Department of Community Sustainability and the Environmental Science and Policy Program at Michigan State University. She's a participatory system modeler, so I hope she's going to explain us, to us what it is, and works directly with stakeholders to build models that foster adaptive learning about the dynamics of coupled human natural systems and to integrate stakeholders' knowledge with academic knowledge. She has worked in communities in Southeast Asia, West Africa, and United States on a range of issues in agriculture, food, and natural resources. She's a Triple uh, AS and Leshner Leadership Institute Public Engagement Fellow for 2018-2019. So please join me in welcoming Laura. Well, uh, thank you so much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real honor to be on this panel, and I want to thank AAAS for inviting me and thank my fellow panelists and Dominique for moderating. Um, so I really value the opportunity to speak on this panel uh, because I wanted to address kind of a common misconception among younger researchers who particularly want to go into academia that a research career is incompatible with public engagement. And I'm here to, right up front, tell you that that's not true. Now, I want to put a caveat on that by saying that 
I am by no means assuming that an academic career is something that all of you want, or it's certainly not the only way to use a PhD, as my distinguished co-panelists uh, demonstrate. But for those of you who want an academic career, there are many ways, I think, to integrate um, engagement and research. And academia does have its challenges, and it also has its perks. So I'm, gonna hear, I'm here to talk about some of those today. So as was mentioned, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Community Sustainability and in the Environmental Science and Policy Program at Michigan State University. So Michigan State is a public land grant institution, so it has a mission to do teaching, research, and outreach that benefit the citizens of Michigan and of the world more broadly. So that mission fits really well with uh, an engagement approach. However, it also is an R1 research institution, right? So that means that it's trying to compete with its peers in terms of producing you know, peer-reviewed papers, grant funding, PhD students graduated, et cetera. And that tension certainly exists at the institutional level, and it also exists at the level of individual faculty, right? And to be honest, as I'm sure we all in this room probably know, uh, faculty are evaluated for tenure and promotion on the latter set of criteria, right? Journal articles, grant funding, PhD students, et cetera. So, how do we navigate that tension if we want to fulfill the public mission while uh, maintaining our careers in a research institution? So I would argue that the way to do that is by viewing those things as being in synergy, not in conflict. And the successful researchers who do engagement that I've uh, worked with at Michigan State and elsewhere are people who can really do that, can really uh, synthesize them. So I'll give you one story about how that might be possible. So we just received funding uh, from the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, uh, which is a part of the, the research uh, arm of the Farm Bill, uh, to do some modeling of the food system in Flint, Michigan, in order to find ways to move the system towards better outcomes for public health, uh, sustainability, and equity and food access. So this, was, this came out of a collaboration that we had that we had with the Community Foundation of Greater Flint, which began before uh, the, the now kind of internationally known Flint water crisis there. So we had done some work with the Community Foundation of Greater Flint around the water crisis, and they started to come to us with some concerns that in the wake of the crisis, there's been a lot of attention on Flint and a lot of money flooding into the city uh, to try to address some of the systemic problems there, including food access and nutrition, but in spite of all of those programs, and some of them have been successful, the folks that work in Flint haven't seen the true shift towards better systems outcomes that they really wanted to see. So they were asking us if some of the modeling tools that we use, uh, some of the simulation modeling, some of the mental modeling tools that we use at Michigan State could help address that issue and help them kind of move the system in the way that they want to go. So I want to emphasize this research project came out of the community concerns. It came out of people working on the ground who wanted to address a very real problem that they had. Uh, so we applied for the funding and we got it. And we have uh, the, the core research team consists of four Michigan State faculty and two um, uh, community members from the Community Foundation of Greater Flint. Uh, we put our, our um, proposed research through not only the, the uh, institutional review board process for human subjects at Michigan State, but also through a community panel who evaluated the research for its potential impacts on and benefits to the community. So we, we went through that process, which was great. Um, we also have a community consultative panel that consists of folks in Flint who are working on various aspects of the food system, who are giving us feedback on each stage of the research and kind of holding us accountable to deliver benefits for the community. And we're compensating them for that work, by the way, uh, financially. And we are going to be involving community members in the data collection, analysis, and interpretation and reporting of the results. And we're also going to be training them in some of the modeling tools that we're using. So how does this project uh, represent the kind of synergy that I'm talking about? Well, uh, as I mentioned, it came out of a real community concern, but it also has important research implications, right? So. Ideally, this project is going to generate both benefits for the community in terms of 
financial compensation, in terms of skills gained, in terms of actual uh, suggestions and answers to some of their real uh, on-the-ground problems. And it also is going to lead to peer-reviewed publications, graduate students trained, uh, teaching opportunities, et cetera. So when we're doing community engagement as academics, we need to think about how we structure things in an equitable way such that everybody involved walks away from the project feeling like they gained something, right? We're operating in an environment where a lot of times in the past, there's been a very extractive nature to research, right? So academics will go into a community, get the data they need, and leave. And what did they leave behind? And so we've been having very deliberate conversations up front in this project about if this project is successful, what do you want to see come out of that? And so let's talk about that and make sure that we're accountable for achieving those results. And obviously, this is what's going to lead to sustainable engagement, right? Because if community partners feel like they really benefited from working with us, that they really did get something out of it, then they're going to want to continue working with us. So now that I've kind of extolled some of the benefits of doing this work, uh, I want to touch briefly on some of the challenges, which I'm sure we all could probably name. Um, so the first is that, as we know, building truly community-engaged work takes time. Right? It takes time to build up those relationships and trust in order to get this work done. And as uh, academics, we're often under time pressure to produce uh, publications, particularly pre-tenure. Right? So how do we deal with those kind of uh, tensions? Uh, one of the ways that I found to deal with it is uh, through producing products about the process itself. So for example, you know, if we're holding a community meeting, you know, can we get some research product out of that along the way to the final grant proposal or the final paper about the model? Um, so producing things along the way can be helpful. And publishing on community engagement practice itself. So thinking about moving your, your research from the, the, not just the content area, but also into the process of doing community engaged research and publishing in that area. And that could be a very uh, great way to get your ideas and, and your research out. Um, this work also, it requires inner work as well as outer work, right? So as I have been doing this work over, over many years now, I've really had to cultivate values in myself of patience, <laughs> humility, self-reflection. Uh, and those are all good. It's good to do that. But I think we can probably recognize that academia doesn't always reward those values. <laughs> you know, if you picture a typical academic, those are probably not the first words that come to mind. So uh, sometimes there's a little bit of cultural whiplash in terms of going from community work to, uh, to going back into academia, where you have to be loud and aggressive and you know, grab people's attention. Um, so that can be challenging. And I will also say, and I, I really thank Ray for bringing up some of these issues, you know, we are working in a community that has been traumatized by decades of racial segregation and economic marginalization. And as a white person going into that community, I really have to do a lot of that work myself as well to try to understand some of the things that have gone on and what some people there are, are dealing with. So, you know, it's just doing the science is not going to cut it. You really have to empathize with, with people's lived experiences. And a final set of challenges comes from uh, academic institutions themselves. So I'm very fortunate to be in a university that has this land grant mission, to be in a department and a college that do value engagement. Um, but you know, there are some challenges. So um, sometimes there can be um, pushback when we're trying to figure out how to apportion budgets, if we're trying to do budgeting in an equitable way and make sure that the money goes to the community for the things that we think the money should go for. Uh, because, you know, public institutions these days are pretty strapped for cash and they want to uh, take as much of that as they can. Um, another example, uh, community partners cannot sit on dissertation or thesis committees for our students. So they may be integrally involved in advising these students as they do this community-engaged research, but they can't do that in a formal way. There's no mechanism for that. So, you know, there's some kind of institutional barriers to really seeing community-university partnerships as true equal partnerships. Uh, so, you know, those are some things that maybe we could change. And if I were to speak to the institutions in the room, I would say, you know, this can be seen as something that community engagement could potentially be seen as something that's burdensome and time-consuming, but in an era in which public support for science is so critical to getting our work done, 
and to getting the funding that we need and the public support we need, you know, what could be more important? So I would argue that we really need to engage in these uh, relationships for the long term and support this work at the institutional level down to the personal level. So that's all I'll say for now and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Laura. We turn into Bri Beltran. Uh, Dr. Bri Beltran is an ecologist by training. As the science director at the heart of the Rockies Initiative, he supports the long-term sustainability of a socio-ecological system in the Intermountain West by developing a strong science program that informs private and public land protection and stewardship and that it's inclusive of all people and cult uh, cultures living in the region. Please join me in welcoming Ed. Thank you very much, Dominique, and thank you, everybody. Um, but first of all, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. I am not a doctor, so I'm, 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 doctor. I am not. Oh. Am I still invited? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I have a master's of science in ecology, um, but I do work in a boundary organization where we need your knowledge as, or our knowledge as a scientific community, either as masters or as PhDs, to apply that knowledge to inform conservation. So the reason um, I think I'm here today is because I have been doing this work for the past five years. At Heart of the Rockies, I lead the science program. I serve as science coordinator. I'm still the only one in the science program, so I guess they were like, oh, I guess you're the director, right? Because <laughs> what else are you going to do? Um, but what, what, what we try to do uh, through my position is to deliver science to our conservation partners. Let me just tell you a little bit about Heart of the Rockies to put everything into context. Heart of the Rockies Initiative, it's a nonprofit conservation organization, and our mission is to increase the pace of private land conservation in the Intermountain West. And the region that we work in is Western Wyoming, uh, Idaho across the, the spine of the, uh, of the Rocky Mountains, Southwest Montana, and we have uh, a partner in, in Southwest Alberta and Southeast BC. So we cover um, a very vast region. And the, two, the, the, the 22 organizations that did local work, local uh, private land protection in the region, they, figured, they, they thought that they needed an umbrella organization that gave them a more large landscape view um, because they all do very valuable local work. But w what does that work mean when you put it together across the Rocky Mountains? So that's what we try to provide at Heart of the Rockies. So in my role as the, uh, as, as the scientist there, um, I, I was hired to deliver science to inform conservation planning uh, in, in, in the region. And and what, when I got there, I realized that there was some pushback from my public. And, and my public is my conservation colleagues. I, I work with uh, conservation professionals in, in the nonprofit world, world and also with state and federal agencies. And there was some pushback, like I could feel it. And I was not making inroads uh, with my colleagues into delivering science to them. And what I realized after it took me about two years, two to three years to realize that what was happening was that I was bringing science to them and I was giving them answers to questions they had not asked. I was bringing very important information from the literature that wasn't relevant to them at that local scale. So um, like Jesus said earlier today, if you were in the, in the earlier uh, talk, I was only able to start engaging with my public, with those conservation professionals, um, when I shut up and listen. When I started listening to them, I was able to bring those questions that they had into my science, inform my science, so I could then start answering questions that were relevant to them. Kind of like what Laura was just talking about. It's like, the community informed my science and then at that point, they are engaged from the beginning. They're invested in the final product. And then I don't have to deliver the science to them. I can just talk to them because they know what I'm going to be talking about and they want to hear what I have to say. So what I have learned in my time at Heart of the Rockies is that community engagement 
is not bringing science to the community, it's having a conversation with the community so we can inform our work. And then I'm pretty sure we're smart enough to figure out how that local question can fit within our big grant that we're gonna put into NSF, into NASA, into whatever. And then we have the big tenurable project that would then answer that local question because that local question is part of that. And, and there we're finding some efficiencies because now we're, finding that, now we're finding that we have the time to do that work because we have a graduate student or because we have the summer salary to do it or whatever. So um, that's, that's what I've learned. Um, the other thing that, um, that I want to talk about is how I support my, my academic partners through my work at Heart of the Rockies. And I could not do what I do. I could not inform 22 land trusts and over 120 stakeholders across the region, and that represents federal agencies, state agencies, policymakers, landowners, all of these people that are part of the community who I engage with, but you know, more often I engage with the, with the conservation side of it. I could not do it without scientific help. I do not have the skills necessary to answer all of the questions that are out there. I do not have the expertise, but what I can do and what these bunch organizations could provide to you if you engage with them meaningfully is we have a lot of social capital. We are your broader impact. So what I can offer to my partners is that gate to or, or opening the gate to the communities there. So, so then we have really meaningful broader impacts uh, in, in a grant. And you know, when, when we're talking with social scientists, now we have I can I can I can go and talk to the ranchers that I know and say, hey, listen, can you talk to this guy? And um, and they say, sure, because they know me. They don't know this guy, but they know me. If you as a scientist go and try to talk to the ranchers, I'm not sure about that. So, so there, I, I support them in, in a way that I can, I, I try to find efficiencies for my colleagues and these boundary organizations could do that. But that only happens if you meaningfully engage with them. I think both Laura and, and, and Ray uh, mentioned something about it. And that, you can do it in different ways, but to me, the way that I have been able to do that engagement successfully is by showing permanency on the landscape. That extractive process where we go, we get the information, we graduate our master's or PhD student, we finish the grant and then we're out. We don't even leave behind us as scientists on the field to keep those relationships with those organizations. That is not going to work because once you show up, they're like, what is your end game? And is it gonna be more work for me as a very limited local organization with an executive director, maybe a part-time uh, conservation director and a volunteer administrative assistant? Now you want me to help you do your research? And, and so they have time constraints as well. But if we show them, and, and I like your, um, the success slide that, that you show, because being successful at engagement is not linear. All of that messy and it takes time. And, and being authentic about, about that engagement. And, and for these organizations and for the local communities to realize that we're being authentic, we need to spend the time. So, so yes, it is, it is not time as in like, it's gonna take more time for you on your everyday job, but it's the time process that it takes to develop that trust with those local organizations so then you can understand what their needs are. Now you have a conversation with them, you understand what their needs are, then you can inform your research to be able to answer those local, uh, those local needs. Um, the other, um, just one more thing that, um, so a lot of what, what I was gonna say was said by, by Lauren and, and Ray Wind, because as a practitioner, all of those things are, 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 are true. And, and we need your support and, and we need to, we need the science, but we, we don't need to, um, we don't need to be talked to, we need to be talked with. And I'm just gonna finish with an example that, of um, a very clear example. I was in, in Big Sky, Montana um, 
in August at a conference, and there was a panel of high school students from Livingston, Montana. Livingston is this, it's the city that, it, uh, sorry, uh, Gardiner, Montana, is the city that is just on the north uh, gate at the Roosevelt Arch. It's within the, the Livingston city limits, and they have a high school there, and these kids, the, um, they run the risk of being run by bison while they're going to, uh, to class in the morning. But um, what, the kid, what they were saying was it was a 17-year-old senior said, do not beat us down with this science. We don't like it. You don't like it if I just come and talk to you and give you my science, and by God, I'm going to convince you of it. Just talk to us. Find that common value. We work with, it, with an 80-20 rule. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. But we firmly believe at Heart of the Rockies Initiative that we have a lot more in common that we have uh, than the differences that we have. We have probably about 80% in common. And, we, and if we find that common ground, if we find the, those common values, we can make progress and, and do good science with people that we may not see uh, eye to eye on other, uh, on other sides of the political spectrum. But if we go in and we find that we talk values, we, and when we start to understand the, the, the questions and the problems that they have, then we can inform our research and then we can um, effectively be continually engaged with the community. I'm going to leave it at that and I look forward to a very nice uh, a conversation. Thank you very much. So thank you to all our speakers, and uh, I'm looking forward to a productive discussion. As you see, we have uh, ample time for questions, comments, uh, and, uh, and uh, productive feedback. Uh, something that I'd like uh, uh, to mention before we start is that, as you can see, there are themes that cross uh, uh, across our panelists' points here. And I think it's important to reinforce this point. Number one, they all uh, uh, implied and, uh, and, uh, and really encouraged all of us to think in terms of public engagement, not as a one-way one stream uh, way of communicating, but really as a dialogue that you establish with those communities you want to, to, to engage with. And this is something that you have all uh, emphasized very well. And number two, that if you do that and if you structure your public engagement in a way that will hear and uh, reply to the concerns of the community, you have to do that in an equitable way. You don't do a public engagement just to suit your own needs, but you do it because, after all, you answer the needs of the community. I hope I'm paraphrasing very well what you're saying here. But then that leads to a question that somebody on, on, on Twitter asked, and, uh, and we can come up later on, is how do you do that? How do you actually find those audiences that are ready to interact with you? How, in a practical way, can you actually find those communities that you want to engage with, that want to engage with you for a mutual benefit. I'll start with um, the way to find those, those organizations of that community in, in the region that I work in is um, by becoming part of these very capacity limited um, conservation organizations. They need somebody to help them monitor a conservation easement. They need people to uh, go help and pull weeds from uh, whatever property. If you are in tune with, the, if, if you can get involved in that respect, then you are a member of, um, you become a valued member for that organization and, we, and you can start pushing uh, on, on issues that are more, let's say, scientific important. But now you start developing that relationship and, and yes, it is out of your personal time, but I think that my, my personal bias is that we as citizens need to be engaged in our local communities and, and, and find what we can do to make our local communities better. So by finding those organizations and finding w where it is that they need the capacity and start helping them with that, that will definitely lead to meaningful engagement, long-term engagement, and understanding what their needs are so then we can inform um, our processes and offer our skills and expertise as professionals to help the organization move forward. That's great. So I would say if you're in academia, 
there's a few things you can do. So one is if you you can look at the parts of your institution that have as their mission to engage with the public. So if I'm at a land grant institution, for example, extension would be one of those. We also have an office of outreach and engagement. So you can check with your uh, institution to see if they have those offices and who they're in contact with who, who would be interested in working with with uh, academics or scientists, and also to take advantage of um, boundary organizations that might be in the communities you work in. So, you know, if there's a particular research topic in which you have some expertise and which you're passionate about, you know, is there a, an organization in that community working on that topic that tends to work with scientists? So in our case, the Community Foundation of Greater Flint is a good example of that type of organization. They work with a number of different scientists. So, uh, and then just to get out into the community, right? To get out and, and, and network. Um, now I will caution that, you know, I, I think it's important that we as scientists um, be careful in how we do that because I would not advocate that you just waltz into a community that's not your own and just be like, hey, I'm here, I'm inviting myself, you know? Um, <laughs> because I, I think that we need to recognize that we go where we're invited. Um, but there are plenty of places that would be happy to invite you. So, you know, you have to look around for those. Yeah, thank you, Dominique. I would answer your question with an example. Um, and my work is, I work for organizations that are very similar to Bry's. Um, so often conservation, wildlife conservation, science groups or advocacy and um, practice groups that are often trying to do work in places where there's a lot of conflict from the local people in terms of what's trying to get done. Um, and so the answer to your question from me is about getting out of a comfort zone, you know, a safe space and a comfort zone that often we, I think, no matter what type of science you're in, we might find ourselves operating amongst these same groups over and over. Breaking out of a comfort zone, whether it's professionally or personally, is just difficult and sometimes unpleasant. Um, the example that I'm going to give um, is about conservation scientists. So not too long ago, uh, conservation scientists realized that we have a lot in common with hunters um, globally. So people who like to shoot all of those wildlife species that we're trying to save, believe it or not, we have a lot in common with them um, because both of these groups want more wildlife on the landscape um, for different reasons, <laughs> but the same overall goal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so realizing that this group, I mean, if I use myself as an example, when I'm meeting with hunters, they are often people who are politically different from me. Um, their value systems are different from mine. We have almost nothing in common except for our love for wildlife and our um, desire to have healthy functioning ecosystems. Um, and so that was a big break for conservation scientists got out of our comfort zone, started meeting with hunters, and now the majority of all funding for conservation in the world globally comes from hunting groups. And so I know this is just a conservation example, but for any type of science, um, I imagine that there is some type of parallel situation where if you, you know, just go to the most you know, distant group from what you're doing, there might be some incredible common interest um, that will allow you guys to um, serve each other. Thank you. Let's go to the microphone. Let's start on the right. If you could identify yourself first, that would be great. Hi, I'm Jenny Bradford, a graduate student from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I was really interested in Ray's comment about bringing in people uh, who aren't scientists but are, who are crucial to getting the science done. I was interested in strategies because I'm about to go on a, like a field collecting trip in Costa Rica, so how I can acknowledge the people that are really important for my work and sort of bring them in and give them the benefits of that work. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I'm a little bit, you know, something that's on my mind because you said that you are currently a graduate student is what Laura said in her talk about how we don't necessarily in academia yet have this formal way for graduate students to get credit for and to be encouraged to do community engagement and public engagement. Um, it's something unfortunate. I know there's a lot of things about academia that we would like to just overhaul, um, and that certainly is one of them. Um, so, you know, there's always that careful, <coughs> excuse me, that careful balance of doing a really good job in your studies the way that you're 
you know, advisory committee is encouraging you to and getting that done, but also speaking to what's important to you at the same time. So I don't think any of us have perfected that. Um, so something that I would suggest to you is to learn a lot more about traditional knowledge systems, um, especially if you're going from the United States into um, places that have been colonized um, in the past. So um, there is a lot of emerging work, especially in ecology and the environmental sciences about traditional ecological knowledge. And so for people who have not been formally trained in Western sciences, um, they always, well, I shouldn't say always, but very frequently hold with them some type of traditional historical knowledge from their upbringing and their heritage in a space. Um, more and more science groups are trying to incorporate uh, traditional ecological knowledge as a type of scientific evidence. Um, that is equal to or used along with Western science. Um, so essentially, you know, we're, I think it would take a lot for us to call non-trained people scientists also, but they're people with a distinct knowledge system um, that comes from their, um, their connection to place. And so if you are able to kind of bring, with, bring that with you, it's a source of empowerment. It can inform your work. It'll make you a better graduate student, a better scientist, but it also empowers people from their place that they actually hold the knowledge systems that we are just studying. Right? I, wanna, I want to second that. Um, a, a lot of the work that we do, we use that, that local knowledge uh, in the Intermountain West. And while maybe we cannot recognize it yet as scientific work, it's definitely expert work. So finding a way to elevate those people as experts um, would be very important. One way that we're trying to do that, and because our um, you know, farmers and ranchers who we are extracting knowledge from constantly keep telling us, you guys get paid to be at these meetings. We don't, we have to leave the ranch behind. We have to stop calving. We have to stop haying to, uh, to come here. You guys are compensated, we're not. So one way to do it is to start compensating those experts that we are, uh, mm -hmm. if, if I'm invited somewhere, I'm getting paid to be here. My organization is paying me and I'm getting reimbursed for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for my travel expenses because I'm considered an expert. Thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> but when we go to the local communities, we usually don't do that. And we don't recognize them as the experts that we know they are because we're extracting knowledge for them. So finding a way that we elevate them as the experts they are, would, it, it's, I, I would recommend that. Great. Laura, you want to add anything? No, just a, that, that those are all excellent points. Yeah, compensating people fairly is a big yeah. one. Um, I would also say, you know, never assume what people do or don't know when you, you know, they may be, quote, just a driver, but they may have uh, an advanced degree. They may, you know, one of the things we hear from the community we work with in Flint is that they are sick and tired of people with PhDs coming in there and assuming that they don't know anything. Right. There are people in the community because they've been dealing with lead poisoning who know a lot more about lead and water and its impacts in the body than some of the scientists that are coming in and trying to lecture them. So I, I would also recommend just go in with that spirit of humility and uh, eagerness to learn and curiosity and not assume that you know more than everybody who's there. This is great, and actually all that, uh, that focus on lay knowledge has been one of the uh, outcome of uh, uh, reports from the National Academy of Science that was looking at scientific literacy mm -hmm. and said that like historically we have been talking about expert knowledge and forgetting the importance of community-based knowledge and lay knowledge. So I'm really happy to see this discussed here today. Let's go to the left of the room here. Hi, um, my name is Zach Eldridge. I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for your talks. I found this vision kind of a, a more democratic community with communities in the driver's seat science very inspiring. Um, one thing I was wondering is how do you take proactive steps to make sure that the institutions you build to create that community engagement are representing everyone? For instance, I can imagine that if you're a working class parent, you might not have the time or resources to participate in an advisory board or something like that. So how do you make sure that you're really hearing from all the voices that are relevant? Somebody wants to start here? How can you make sure you hear about all the voices of the community? And this is something that we often hear. Always the same people to go to public meetings, always the same people show up at the city hall meetings and so on. Right? Is that your question? Yeah. Um, I 
am going to work really hard to be concise. <laughs> <laughs> like two minutes. <laughs> um, there isn't, in my opinion, there is not a quick fix for that. So the way I'm hearing your question is a lot about diversity and equality and equal representation, opportunity, e equal access to opportunity, for example. Um, and that's something that's really important to me. Um, it's really important to science, right? Science is in the business of solving problems for the betterment of society. And so that's best done when everyone's included. Um, I strongly feel when I answer questions like this that the, the big answer is the way to go. So essentially um, deconstructing institutionalized um, oppressive forces is the answer to your question. And so that is my concise way of saying it. It's really difficult, right? So making sure that barriers to participation in science are knocked down means that probably a lot of people who are powerful and who are privileged will have to become uncomfortable relinquishing a lot of that power and privilege. Um, there are so many people out there who have partial answers, if not the entire answer, to a lot of the questions that we're asking as a scientific community, and there are such tremendous barriers to their participation. So um, I th there's a quote that floats around on social media a lot that says, uh, um, oh god, now I'm going to get it wrong. <laughs> it's something about how um, when you come from privilege, equality might feel like oppression. It's something along <laughs> those lines, right? When you're used to having all the power, uh, at some point sharing power yeah. might feel like you are being victimized, mm -hmm. right? And things change. So, <clears throat> do I nail it? <laughs> it's something <laughs> along those lines. Um, and essentially, it, you know, it will take a mass force of people of privilege and power looking within themselves and being really honest and vulnerable and willing to make a change to bring other folks in. Um, so that's my really big picture pie in the sky answer. Um, but a, a more like action-oriented answer might be allyship and action. Mm -hmm. um, and I use those two words because allyship is action. And this has to do with science, this has to do with social justice, this has to do with you know, kind of every kind of field under the sun. Um, but every single person in the world has some type of privilege. Um, you know, I talked about intersectionality. There is some part of every person's identity that is privileged over another person's identity. It might be race, it might be social class, it might be religion, it might be gender identity, it might be all kinds of different things. Um, but, but making sure that when you are centering that part of your identity that is privileged, you are able to advocate for and become an ally to people who are on the opposite end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, so that can go in a lot of different ways. You know, as a straight woman, it's important that I recognize homophobia when I see it and advocate for people who um, don't have that power. Um, and that advances science, right? So more participation from people from marginalized communities enhances science. Um, even so, so, the last thing I'll say is, is another little snippet that, that any kind of social justice is not distinct from advancements to science, right? Um, science works when societies work, when people work. And if we're talking about barriers to people being involved in science, that barrier can be absolutely anything. So doing a tiny little bit of work to knock down a barrier or doing like giant transformative work to knock down a barrier is all important. Thank you. So Pat asked a question on Twitter that's uh, related. <laughs> and uh, the question is uh, how to encourage more public engagement without excluding people based on gender, race, and age that we all mentioned. You all mentioned something uh, in that regard. But more specifically, do you know platforms or groups that could help to do this, to break those barriers? Laura, anything in, in your district there or uh, Right, any well, while they think I'll answer this again, I do not want to dominate the like more social justice aspects of the conversation. Um, but again, I'll just reiterate that certainly um, uh, justice, equity, and inclusion is a path towards better science of any type mm -hmm. of science, period. So when there is tremendous oppression against a certain group, I will say, you know, certain immigrant groups trying to work in the United States, 
Our science isn't performing the way it should perform because we don't have the participation of these people. Um, so in terms of science groups that are working to level the playing field, that's less important than groups and organizations, period, that are fighting for the equality and the inclusion and opportunities for people from different groups, right? So again, when we had women of all kinds being excluded from academia and being excluded from science, you know, through legislation that said, you, you know, you're a woman, you can't go to the school, our science, our politics, our innovations were not as good as when women were allowed to be included, right? We didn't need groups for the advancement of women in science to make that better. We needed groups that fought for women's rights, period. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, to the person who asked on Twitter, you know, what groups are out there, find your cause that you're interested in and guaranteed by fighting for that cause, you are enhancing participation in science. Brian, you wanna come in? Yeah, I just want to add a little bit to that. I think you're spot on. And um, one of the things, a, a, a little add-on to, to the previous question that, that was asked, like, we need to recognize that we're never going to be as inclusive as we think we are. And so recognizing, recognizing where we're falling short, even, even though we're trying to be as inclusive as, as possible and bringing in everybody, maybe we have that working parent that can be there. I think that recognizing to ourselves and when we present the results or when we have those talks, it was like, this is the perspective of the community. We need to recognize and, and be aware of who was in there yeah. and make sure that right. we know it and that everybody else knows it. Um, the other thing, um, I personally um, realized that I was a brown man uh, six months ago, really. And I, I, <laughs> I said that tongue in cheek, but um, I, I was, at a, I was at a workshop and, and really came to me, we were talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what I realized was that I live in the Intermountain West, which is very white. I work for a conservation organization, which happened to be very white as well, uh, perpetuating the white colonial lens in the landscape on the land that isn't mine. As a brown man, I was doing that. And I needed to start doing a lot of work on that. And how do I make my, my own work more inclusive, my own work less racist? Mm -hmm. And what, um, what I realized then, I, I actually, it, it was almost therapy that like the, the foundation actually gave us a, a coach for five hours and my coach was pretty much my therapist once I realized this. <laughs> um, but what he, what he told me was, Brian, choose the, choose the part, choose the piece of the pie that you're interested in and that you can advance and then be an ally for those parts of the pie that you are not going to be the tip of the spear. The tip of the spear for me now is how do I make, how do I do conservation that is inclusive of the tribal nations um, that are uh, in, within my service area and who were the, uh, the, the landholders of the land before the, uh, the Homesteading Act. So how, how do we include those voices into conservation in the region? They are absolutely silenced. And it's not because they're, they're quiet, it's because we don't include them. So that's the piece of the pie that I have chosen. But that's not to say that we need to recognize that this is a, a, a region that is very homogeneous uh, religiously and, the, and that is, is very traditional. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to put on my, on my signature, he, he's him because that may actually take away from, from the part of the pie that I am trying to advance. But that doesn't mean that I cannot be an ally to those people that are working on those issues in the landscape. So find who those people are, and you probably know who they are. Be an ally to them, be a, super, be a support to them, and they will probably be support to you, and then you can work on your piece and making sure that we're advancing science by being a lot more inclusive. But don't try to take on everything else at the same time because you will be less effective. And talking about uh, taking everything on, uh, a question specific for Laura on Twitter, for Jess Chen and Alison Coffin, I'm sorry I'm paraphrasing to bring all your, your questions together. Uh, the idea, you know, like, and I think somebody touched upon that in academia, that those extracurricular activities are not rewarded and so on. Uh, 
how could you, how can we formally reward engagement and outreach? And as a professor at the, one of those institutions, what are we doing to be sure that these uh, kind of um, uh, activities can be part of tenure decisions and so on? Mm -hmm. And I'm putting several questions together for six of time. Yeah. So obviously, this is this is a great question, right? And I mean, there probably has to be some kind of institutional and systemic change in that direction. So, and I think that there are some encouraging signs. I see more and more universities, for example, offering an award for public yep. engagement. So that's recognized, right? Uh, our university is has a program that trains graduate students in how to do public engagement, which is wonderful. Um, but again, the reality of you know, research institutions today is that predominantly tenure and promotion decisions are made on publications, graduate students trained, and grant dollars, right? And so um, I, I guess my perspective at the moment is that we, we do need to see those things as being in synergy, that there, I, don't, I fundamentally don't think it, there's a conflict between doing research that is deeply engaged and that's working with the community and generating publications. In fact, I think that a lot of science is calling us for us to do more of that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I work in the sustainability field, and if you look at what's been published in the sustainability field in the last 20 years, there are all of these calls for we need to be working outside of you know, traditional science. We need to be working with communities. We need to be doing transdisciplinary research. Well, you know, let's do it then, right? Let's not just talk about it. Um, so I think that there's kind of a, two edges to that sword. There's ways to push the institution and the boundaries of what is rewarded and recognized in academia, which absolutely needs to happen. And look, I mean, I, you know, our institution is a diverse place. I, I mean, not everybody can do everything to the hundred percent of ability. You know, like if you're a phenomenal teacher, that should be recognized. If you're phenomenal at bringing in grant dollars, that should be recognized. If you're phenomenal at doing engagement, that should be recognized. You know, we can all work together. Um, so recognition of that needs to happen, but also I think we need to, um, and this is what the point I was trying to make in my talk, I think we need to stop seeing these things as being in conflict. Like if you, you, know, you do engagement, then you don't have time for research. If you do engagement, then you don't have time for teaching. How can we integrate those? I'm, uh, in a few weeks, I'm taking my students, my graduate modeling students to Flint, where they are going to help facilitate a meeting of food policy councils from around the state of Michigan in identifying and diagnosing systems problems that they're dealing with. So students are getting like real world training in how to facilitate these kind of conversations. The folks uh, at the meeting are gonna get hopefully insights into the problems they're dealing with. So like finding ways to kind of do that to really integrate these things, you know, I think that's important. May I follow up on this? Yeah. I, will, I promise to be brief. I'm just going to follow up on that um, question because I'm curious if it's from someone who might be at an early point in their career. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to share that as someone in an early point of her career, um, I have been getting a lot of great coaching from mentors about um, applying for professorships and getting into academia and onto the tenure track. And some of the very encouraging um, advice that I've been getting is um, for me to essentially, or for me or for anyone, mm -hmm. to essentially present themselves to a group, to a department as their full self, right? So to say, essentially, this is who I think I could be, or this is who I intend to be at your institution, and give the whole picture, right? Someone who publishes, and someone who leads a lab, and someone who is a leader in public engagement and science communication as a means to break down barriers or solve this you know, public health crisis or whatever. And it seems that when you, you know, again, bring, I will use the word authenticity again, bring your authentic self as a full scientist with different values, different skills, and emphasize your strengths you know, so if you're strong in, you know, your laboratory science and you're also strong in your, um, you know, science writing and public and uh, public facing work, um, to bring that as an asset and as a skill set to your applications or to your negotiations with departments, it likely will go better than you think. Um, and again, this is advice that I've been getting, you know, I haven't necessarily put it to action for myself, but it seems that more and more, um, you know, identifying the different ways that you engage with science as your own person and the different ways you might um, offer science to the world um, can be seen as, as something valuable to different academic institutions. Thank you, Ray. Let's go back to the microphone. Thank you for your patience. 
Hi, my name is Ellen Weiss, and I work as a science policy research communicator at an international research organization called the Population Council. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm cold. I'm so glad the M word came up, and that's money. That you would, that you brought up the issue that it, these things cost money for it costs money for public engagement. So, Laura, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how supportive your foundation was for you to do this work because. I have found that unless they let you budget for things like honorariums, transportation, meeting costs, mm -hmm. it, in many cases it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good point. So as both of my co-panelists have made the point, you know, part of doing this work in a truly equitable way is to you know, provide the financial resources that people need to participate on, on both sides of you know, the community university partnership. Uh, my institution is generally very supportive of that um, with a few, you know, there's been a few glitches as I kind of alluded to in my talk. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you that there needs to be a recognition that if people are showing up to a meeting and providing their expertise and spending their valuable time, they should be compensated mm -hmm. for that. They're contributing to the production of the research. And, you know, as Bri said, we're, we're paid for our time. Why shouldn't they be paid for theirs? So I think sometimes it's a little bit about educating uh, folks above you sometimes at your institution about that uh, and making that case. But, you know, you, you have to kind of stand your ground that that's what you need to get this research done. Let's go to the left here. My name is Margaret Snowden. I'm a grandmother and a retired obstetrician. When I went to medical school, there were three women in my class, and now, luckily, everything has changed. <clears throat> I'm trying to raise my granddaughters to think of themselves as scientists, which in my day was very impertinent. I would like to hear your definition of a scientist. That's a great question. That is a great question. OK, so who wants to give it a shot? We're going to get three, four definitions if I actually wow. put one, too. As the non-scientist in the panel, I'll, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Um, no, I consider myself a scientist. I, um, I think a scientist is a person that asks a question and follows, um, you know, we were trained in scientific method, but a, a, somebody that asks a question and interprets results in, in, and then gives an answer based on, on, on the data and the results, whichever the question is. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the ecological field or in, in any field. Just ask a question, find the information, and come up with an answer that is supported by that information. Laura? And that's how I'm trying to raise my 14-month-old daughter. <laughs> I, I agree with what he said. <laughs> Oh, I'm so bad at these types of questions. Um, yes, I absolutely agree. Um, at someone who asks a question and is uh, committed to tweaking any part of it to find an answer. Um, what popped into my head when you asked your question, and I admire uh, who you are and probably a lot of what you've been through, um, is that there's a science to so many things. There's a science to visual art, and there's a science to you know performance, and there's a science to you know all kinds of creative things um, as well. And so, to me, a scientist is someone who engages in a process and dedicates themselves to a process in order to discover or to create. Um, and that's really, really loose. And I am certainly not you know that poetic normally, but that. Um, that would be my answer. And uh, I think it's important, therefore, to remind all of us there's a science of science communication as well. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right? All right, so let's go to the right here. Um, hi, my name is Tina Ellie. I'm a graduate student at uh, CUNY. Actually, I'm no longer a graduate student. I'm a postdoc. Um, <laughs> 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 it's only been uh, two months, so I'm getting used to it. Um, so I really appreciated uh, all of your input and also the diversity of the input, not just uh, also. Um, so I have, when I was a freshman in college, um, my mentor told me that often scientists forget that our research is funded by everybody's tax money, from the janitor to the cab driver to the president of the university. 
So they own our research. We're not doing them a favor. We owe them that. We have a moral imperative to communicate our science because it's theirs. And we are never told that. Mm -hmm. I can't recall a single class during my entire PhD where that was mentioned, that the NIH is not that entity that decides to fund or not. The NIH gives money that was given to them by the janitor, by my friend who worked his, you know, two shifts at McDonald's. They own it. So I feel that it's a message that should be encouraged, and I wish the AAAS website had a phrase on that. Mm. You own the science. Your money paid for it. And an organization with your kind of reach, I think it will go a long way. Um, now to my question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so that's a message that was given to me that I think is worth uh, sharing. The second one is we're all talking about PhDs and masters and how, you know, when you become a PhD, you become a postdoc and a faculty and how um, scientific engagement is that thing you're trying to squeeze into your life. We forget about undergrads. They are a population that is driven. They are scientists. They have asp uh, aspiration to become scientists. Some of them don't. But we train them as scientists. So we forget that we can also remind them that when they're in the labs, like I have a bunch of undergrads that I have trained, I remind them their work is funded by themselves and not a member of the community. So they are stewards who should be able to, if they really master their science, communicate it to anyone who asks them a question. And they should be willing to do it. And there should be an enthusiasm. And most college students are happy to talk to people if you make them feel and remind them that people will find it interesting. And it's different. Um, so I feel that's something from the entire panel, usually undergrads are kind of overseen and these non-entity, they're like those things and training that we don't really think of as assets. So do you want to comment on these? Do you have undergrads? Oh, sorry, was that your question? Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> my actual question keep is- keep it short so we can yeah, keep to other is people. There, is there a repository? Does the AAAS or any organization has a repository of all the possible projects that were done for public outreach and communication? And if there isn't such repository, could you start one? Because it would be a good thing for the person who's in Michigan or Idaho or Brooklyn to say, hey, you know, this person went to churches and spoke to them, and this is what they did for public engagement. Maybe I can try it here. So having that repository um, point. That's it. That, does it exist? <laughs> so I think there was more comments than questions, but I think those are very good points. The undergrad involvement in, in research. Yeah, and I don't know if anyone from AAAS wants to respond to the question. So I think maybe in the, after the panel, so we give time to people that have just, questions. I would just say that is a great idea. Yeah. Like the USGS has a repositories like that. And, and those, for, for us, for me, that's a really valuable resource. So having a repository, like yeah. I think that's a brilliant idea. So I would encourage tri AAAS to do something like that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's go to the left here. Hi, first of all, thank you for a really insightful panel. My name is Molly Nixon, and I lead the scientific publications group for the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. And a lot of your answers have been focused on traditional academics, people who are on the tenure track, people who are leading labs. Um, and there's this idea that PhDs or master's students who have stepped off that track and are doing full-time scientific communications are no longer real scientists. That so long as you're no longer doing bench work, you somehow are a little bit discredited within the scientific community and your intellectual contribution is no longer valued. So what can we do to help broaden the sense of what is a scientist and to raise the profile of professional scientific communicators within the academic organizations? Thank you, and related question on, uh, on Twitter, so maybe you can comment on both from Doris, saying that how can we make this more normal as in academia, even when many faculty don't participate in public engagement are irritated if students pursue these things. So they, they, we're always thinking of academia, and uh, we don't feel like uh, it's okay if you leave academia to do these kind of things. 
So I think it's kind of related to the question. Somebody wants to Yeah, I'll, I'll start. And thank you for your question. I, I hate answering every question with, I don't have the answer. Um, but certainly, I am an individual who deliberately decided to use my PhD and my academic training um, to work at an organization and do science at an organization that is a science communication organization. Um, I'm lucky that I am an active research scientist um, with active research projects that I then get to communicate about. Um, but that is certainly not the norm. Um, and so, again, I, I've been giving a lot of very general answers, but in general, it's important for people to not be boxed in. You know, as a society, it's important for us to not say, oh, a congressman looks like this, um, because certainly, you know, government officials can look like anything or be from any background um, as long as they're effective. So again, just, just changing the culture of our institutions and the culture of maybe our scientific community to make sure that it's inclusive of all kinds of scientists. A scientist doesn't look like someone who is you know, at the bench or part of a lab necessarily. A scientist looks like someone who is engaging in science. Um, you know, with that said, I sometimes have to check myself um, because I do have this strong academic background and training. And sometimes I think to myself, oh, yeah, that person used to be a scientist. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, again, I, I'm doing the work within myself to make sure that I am not perpetuating the problem. Um, but in general, breaking down um, just very rigid structure to who is accepted. Um, I will also give some scientific evidence to support what right. I just said. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, my lab in graduate school is engaged in a project looking at the Endangered Species Act. Um, every animal that is listed on the endangered species list in the United States um, gets a recovery plan, and different scientists write the recovery plan. Um, what science um, what biologists think is necessary for this species to recover um, and be delisted. Um, we did this study that found a couple papers that suggested that the most effective recovery plans, um, so meaning the recovery plans listed for species that were more likely to actually do better, their populations were going to increase, they could be delisted, were written by diverse sets of biologists. And by diversity, they did not mean racial diversity. They meant diversity of institutions. Mm -hmm. So your, your organism was more likely to be um, recovered and taken off the endangered species list if the biologists involved in its recovery were from academia, were from state agencies, were from nonprofits, were from local school systems, and were from traditional ecological knowledge groups. And so that is scientific evidence and proof, and I believe the author is Foley, in case anyone wants to look it up. That is evidence and proof that scientists within and outside of academia working together are more likely to solve conservation problems um, empirically. So hopefully that gives some answer. Good point. So we have uh, three minutes left. I want to make sure that we have uh, an, an opportunity for Everyone, but please free also to come to talk to uh, our wonderful panelists at the end. We also have breakout se sessions following this where we can go in depth. I know that there's a lot of questions about different institutions, different ways to deal with these issues, so we can take advantage of breakout sessions. Do you want to add anything to the previous question, or should I go to the microphone? Oh, well, I, I just want to add, I think that's an excellent point, and I would point out that of the three of us on this panel, only one is in academia now, so right. we are trying to represent that diversity, I think. And I will say I have six current PhD students, and only one wants to be an academic. Right. Maybe that means I'm a good advisor or a bad advisor. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite figured that out. But part of my uh, you know, thinking is how do I train them for the careers and the roles that they want? So focusing on things, like I mentioned, like bringing them to actually engage with community members trying to solve problems so they have those skills if that's the career they want to go into. So, yeah. Right? Just, just a quick comment to that. I, I think that the cultural change is important, but I think that cultural change st starts from, from, indi from individuals. And I think that um, just think about how you're training your students and if you are training your students to think academia or failure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, when I was in grad school, I was actually in a PhD program and I was told that, you know, it's like, Unfortunately, like I was a very good baseball player that could make it to triple A, but never to the big leagues. So, you know, statements like that mm -hmm. would, would, you know, so for a while I thought I was a failure, but here I am today. 
Okay. <laughs> nice. So you get the last question. So please, can you keep the question brief? Okay. So it will be very quick. I'm from uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, work as an PIO. And uh, uh, today we are talking about uh, to engage public. Uh, uh, and I think uh, to engage public in your own country is one thing, but to, to engage public in a global context is another thing. So how do you better, uh, do you have a better suggestion to better engage the uh, public in a global context? Uh, for example, to overcome the culture difference, so the culture shocks. That is my question. Thank you very so, much. So great way to conclude the panel, like a big question, you know, so who wants to give it a shot? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think we can engage the public globally, but I think we have, we can have, let me see, let me get my words right. I do, not, I do not think I can personally engage the public globally, but I do think that if each of us involve our public locally, then we will have a globally engaged public. Great point, Laura. I hope that makes sense. 10 seconds for Laura yeah, and I Ray. Mean, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that this work so much involves relationship building and trust and, and kind of personal relationships. And so I, I often have a hard time seeing how it can be kind of scaled up to a global scale. But I agree, if all of us engage locally, then that will be a globally engaged population. Ray? My 10 second answer is that in order to do that, we need experts that aren't scientists. I do think it's possible, but I don't think it's possible that scientists will do the best job at figuring out how to engage the public about science globally. I think that there are experts who probably, if they were in this room, would raise their hand and say, I know the answer, we've got one. Um, and so again, I think that that is outside probably a lot of our training, but that there are innovative and creative minds that could probably get us started if we'll let them in and give them a chance um, immediately. Great and question. This is a great point and let's remind everyone that social scientists are actually scientists and that uh, we are eager to be involved with everyone that actually has in those projects and interdisciplinarity maybe is key also to solve all our problems. Thank you so much everyone. Thanks to the panel. All right, before you all run away, uh, I wanted to give you some instructions about the breakout sessions for this afternoon. Uh, so those sessions will begin at 2.30 p.m. Here in the ballroom, we will have a networking fair that focuses on building engagement capacity on campus and in communities. And that will kick off with short introductions from teams that are working on some of those projects. And then there will be time for you to actually talk with those individual teams sort of around the room. Um, in the rooms just outside in the hallway, we'll have additional breakouts focusing on research practice partnerships, communicating science across boundaries, communicating uncertainty, broader impacts, infographics, clear communication, and frameworks for engagement. Uh, so we'll have signs up so you can find those. We'll also have AAAS staff around to help guide you to the right rooms. Um, a reminder to please take the survey uh, the next slide. which is the next slide, sorry. Yeah. Please take our, oh. please take our survey um, and tell us what you thought of the seminar. And then for those of you who have signed up for the Engaging Scientists and Engineers and Policy Discussion, be back here at one o'clock for a town hall style meeting about policy and communication sessions taking place during the rest of the meeting. And we'll see everyone else back here or in the breakout rooms at 2.30 for the networking fair and breakouts.